Hello and welcome to Profiles in Risk. This is your host, Tony Canyas, uh, back home after 17 days on the road. Very, very happy to be back home in Atlanta. And uh, we are recording on uh, Tuesday, December 28th, which is kind of the weird week when we're all, uh, we're, we're back to work, but, but not quite fully, right? Like post-Christmas, but not quite the New Year's, uh, especially in our, in our industry. Uh, and, and today I have with me Alisa Stamp. Close, Alyssa. Uh, I always try, Alisa Stamp. <laughs> uh, usually it's the last name that I screw up. Uh, Co-founder, CEO, and president at Insure Equality. Alisa, thank you so much for joining me today. H how's it going? It's going great. Thanks for the invite. I'm excited to talk to you. And uh, I guess I can share a little bit about what IE does, and I, mm -hmm. I talk about it in terms of IE, but you're right, it is called insure quality. So if I had to summarize, we are a third party accountability partner. Uh, there's three words that I use when we talk about it, transparency, accountability, and community. So right now we're in phase one, which is about transparency. It's about signing a pledge and telling people stories if they're comfortable telling them. The next phase will happen hopefully at the beginning of next year when we release our tech product and that's going to be the accountability phase. And then we have an ongoing phase, which is building community, having resources put together for people that want to be more inclusive or don't know where to start in that journey, like translation services, or we talked about our good friend, Amy Wanninger earlier today. She's on our resources page as a partner as well. So if people haven't heard of her, they can now access that information. Okay. So this is a really interesting one. Uh, out of, out yeah. of the hundreds of interviews we, we've had on, on profiles, the majority have been InsureTech founders, not because I'm a huge fan of InsureTech, uh, but just because it's easier to get InsureTech founders than it is to get carrier people, which, which is kind of my, my biggest interest is carrier people, although we do talk a lot about the broker side too. Um, so, so somehow, well, you and I were not connected, uh, and yet as soon as you launched Insure Equality, uh, within a couple of days, I got word of it. And within a week, I, I, I'd gotten word from two different sources who are not connected to each other, which tells me, like, immediately, as, as soon as I saw the URL, uh, insureequality.org, uh, I immediately went, like, I'm glad somebody's doing something, right? What, oh, what are they doing, right? Like, I'm, I'm glad somebody's doing something because we desperately need help on the, on the DEI uh, side and, and Amy Wanninger and others ha have been doing a lot of, of work on it, but 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 having an organization dedicated to to specifically to helping the industry do that better is is, is fantastic. Um, and it also told me that 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 what what you're doing is resonating with people. Either that or you're a fantastic marketer, one of the two. Because <laughs> I got I got to work so so quickly, and and the website was beautiful from the beginning. Uh, right, so, so you clearly spent a lot of time preparing for 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 this. So so, let, I love the idea of an accountability partner, and, and I hadn't thought of it that way when I when I first went through the website. Uh, what I did find super interesting is that, that that you're asking companies to to pledge to follow. I don't know if you call it a a, a code of conduct or or what to, to pledge that, that, that they're going to, to be better at this. And, and as I was reading that, I, I, I was literally thinking, okay, we've been doing insurance research for like seven years and never had the guts to ask companies, hey, here's exactly what we want you to do. Sign the pledge on how you're going to be better at, at engaging and retaining millennials, which is what we've always been kind of focused on. Uh, so, so I love the approach of, of asking for, for, for that proactive move, uh, co the proactive commitment, and, and, and uh, basically, how, how do we move the, 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 the company from, and the industry overall for, for, from the idea of, of being better at DEI and actual action, measurable action? So uh, how, did, how, did, how, did, how did you get the idea? How, how, how did you come to this? It was a very long journey, <laughs> but let me just say this first. 
Um, thank you for calling out that this work has been ongoing for a while because there have been a lot of people laying the groundwork that made this possible. So I don't wanna go without acknowledging those efforts. Um, it really started, and you, you mentioned Meg's podcast. Um, it really started with the incident that happened to me and the conversations that followed that incident. Because initially, when that happens to you, when something of that nature happens to you, you go through the whole gambit of emotions and you're like, what do I do? What can I do? And I had been through it more than once, not to that degree, but more than once. And so this was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back for me. And I said, no, this cannot be my ongoing journey in this industry. I have six designations, one of them CPCU. I've worked my butt off. I spent most of my time on the carrier side. And here I was promised, you know, do your work, keep your head down and you'll be fine. And that didn't seem to add up to me. So I started having conversations with other people and it quickly turned into, yeah, that happened to me or that happened to my friend or yeah. And there was a whole bunch of factors that contributed to that. So it didn't matter where we were. It didn't matter what our backgrounds were. It didn't matter how old we were, what we looked like. It was continuing to happen to everybody. And the common theme was that everybody was signing NDAs or some form of confidentiality agreement. And so the thought was that we were going through this alone because we were essentially sworn to silence. But once we started opening that conversation, it quickly became oh, wow, this is way worse than we thought. So initially, I just wanted to tell my story. I know there's a lot of grief out there with people just talking about these things, but it's important because when I started to get the feedback of, yeah, this did happen, that exact thing happened to me, actually, it kind of unlocked something in me and told me, we have a bigger issue. We have some work to do. So... I started to talk to people about, okay, how do I do this? How do I tell my story? And I was quickly stopped by someone and she goes, Alyssa, what makes your story so special? What makes your story so different? And it kind of knocked me back a little bit, but in a really good way, because I realized nothing. You could hit control copy, control paste a dozen times and change like either the town or the date and it would be the same. And so then it became, all right, this is probably an issue with the industry, or this is a systems issue. How do we change the system? And how do we move it in such a way that we honor the people that have been doing the work and that are constantly doing the work and try to help people that either don't have access, know where to start, et cetera. So it opened up a whole bunch of conversations and it started with the pledge, as you mentioned, but it quickly became all right, so we can have people sign this, but then what does it do if they just sign it and move on? And that's when the tech piece came into play and then the resources came into play and then the stories. And it really, it's one of those things that you know you're supposed to be doing when all of the pieces just fall into place without you even asking about it. Let, let, let me pause because there's a lot there. There is a lot. Uh, so, so, so first of all, uh, when, when we say Meg, uh, we, we mean Meg McKean, Meg McKean. Uh, and her podcast, is, his, her fantastic podcast is called Bound and Determined, and it's about women in insurance. And, and Elisa, I, I have switched her. Lisa, Lisa, Lisa uh, okay. has had two appearances on, on Meg's podcast. Uh, the one that I heard, uh, it was from November 16, and it's, it's uh, season four, episode two. I'll try to remember to include the link, but, but the listeners can easily find that uh, Bound and Determined, November 16, 2021, uh, season four, episode two, is this a, as good as it gets? And then uh, uh, you had a prior appearance uh, that I had not listened to, and I went back and listened to after I listened to, 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 to this one, uh, I don't know, a, a year before, or so October 12, 2020, which is called The Shift in Perspective. That's season two, episode five. But this, this episode... Uh, season four, episode episode two, is this as, as good as it gets? It's this is a hard hitting. Uh, how do how how do, how do I put it? Uh, 
hard hard hitting uh trigger warning kind of episode right like, 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 like this, this i i was blown away of hearing this conversation out in the open and and uh yeah it, it it really hit me i've been in this industry for for 12 years uh as a male i live in a very different way now i'm not a white male I, i'm not a golf playing white male i've never been on, on the on the broker side i've always been on the carrier side usually in larger carriers where things seem to be better controlled there's um, an HR department, so, right? Exactly, exactly. Where, where there's a real HR department that that tends to be overly careful rather, rather than overly loose. Right. Uh, so, so this is the side of the industry that that I don't see, right? And that I'm assuming doesn't exist anymore, right? That, that I've heard stories of it existing back in the '70s in the carrier side, but that I've never seen, right? And I, I've I've never lived. Um, so, so basically, for the listeners, yes, once we. Once you finish listening to this episode, you should go listen to listen to that episode on Bound and Determined. But what we're talking about, basically, it, it's full on, completely uh, reckless, shameless sexual harassment. Not not like subtle, which would still which is still unacceptable, right? Let's let's make that super clear. Like 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 creating a hostile work environment is would is still unacceptable. Uh, but we're talking like direct, uh, reckless, shameless, Reason. open sexual harassment happening in 2020 or 2021 or the right, right, in the last in, in the modern <laughs> era in right, the industry right. is, is absolutely crazy. So 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 you went through this experience, started talking about it, and 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 realized that many 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 other people ha- had gone through it and continued to, to go through it. Uh, so clearly, it much more work needed, needed to be done. Um, so, so you, you mentioned, uh, an NDA. Okay. So, so, so in, in my experience, uh, non-competes are common in the broker side. Uh, I've never had to sign anything on the carrier side, uh, even as a salesperson. So I'm guessing that the NDA came into play once, uh, once you went to HR or to the HR equivalent, what, 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 once you said, I'm not going to stand for this and I, I'm bringing in uh, the cavalry, so to speak. So the- that has happened to me in my career. Um, and it happens to a lot of people in these situations when you call out an ism or a phobia of sorts. Um, and it's, they'll frame it as a protection for both parties. And when you're in that moment and you're raw and you're vulnerable, all you want is to be protected and just move on. You don't really want to like belabor it. You just want to get out. Like you just want it to be over and not think about it anymore. But what I found is it's particularly damaging to that person long-term, the person that comes forward because you don't get to talk about it or you don't feel like you're allowed to, even with like, my husband or like with a close friend or a therapist or something where you would have that autonomy you don't feel like you can and that's really damaging because then you may not process it you may not heal from it the right way and then secondarily because that conversation is not actively happening other people aren't either warned by it or aren't aware that this happens then they don't know what to do if they face it And I can't tell you how many times earlier in my career, when something like that happened, I would have someone come up behind me, another woman and go, I went through the same thing. Here's how I got through it. So it's never like the before. There's never that proactive. Like you want to, as an insurance professional, you're like, we should be more proactive, not reactive, but it felt very reactive. So it was just, it was part of the normal dialogue, part of the normal conversation. And You mentioned being on the carrier side most of the time. I was on the carrier side for most of my career too. I spent close to 10 years on the carrier side and half of that was in marketing as a marketing rep. So I was dealing with the agency side. So you were out on the field dealing with the agents in person. Yeah, yeah. And so- Which which is almost like working at an agency. You're exposed to to their day-to-day, yeah. Yeah, and so even then though, because you talk, you mentioned like that protective feeling you have on the carrier side. And that is very true. I mm-hmm. remember feeling that and being there. And it felt like we'll often make the comparison to like the ivory tower because you do, you feel 
mm. kind of disconnected in a way, protected, safe, fine. And here's where I started to dig back a little bit because at first I was like, oh yeah, no, there's no way that this happens. But after this past incident that you referenced with Meg McKean's podcast, I started to kind of go back in my history a little bit and think about it and think about all of the times that something of that nature would have happened because what happens over time is it adds up and it adds to this weight and it kind of informs your decisions going forward. So when something like this happened later in my career, my first instinct was to ignore it and to not tell anybody because I was terrified of being retaliated against. Um, and that's a very common fear if you watch it happen time and time and time again. So um, let, let, me, let me see if, I, if I'm understanding yeah. it properly. So, okay, so, 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 so you're a field rep, right? You work for a large carrier that, that at home is doing a good job keeping people yes. uh, in line, has, has a, you know, a, a well-protective uh, HR department that is protecting you, uh, right? And, uh, keeping people on, on, on good behavior. Uh, so it doesn't decline into, into an episode of Mad Men. But you're out visiting much smaller agencies, right? That that don't have their own HR department, uh, and your own your own larger company is in there to 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 guard you. Uh, so so as 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 a, as a young woman in an industry, and especially if you're dealing with 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 agents, you're dealing with a lot of old fashioned white men, right? That 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 grew up in in the industry before we had a lot of women in it, uh, yes. and so you start getting comments and looks and 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 whatever right so over time it adds up over time you you start changing the way you dress when when you when you're visiting an agency kind of thing so am i, am I reading correctly i'm reading you the story are. correctly okay you perfect. are and it has actually become part of the culture of insurance to have these conversations rep to rep so but yeah bear with me for a second so like mm, if no you problem. were handing off an agency to another rep like woman to woman, if I was handing it off to another woman. You tell them who to be careful with. Absolutely. You have the conversation of avoid so-and-so's office. Don't wear skirts here or don't do this. Go to Janice if you have a problem. You know, you do the whole mm -hmm. thing. And it, it it's a known entity and we just deal with it because the, the back end of it is, well, they write a million dollars of premium with us a year. Or we, we've had this relationship for six decades. We can't end it now. But what it does is it tells your reps or your underwriters or anybody on the carrier side, we value this relationship more than we value whether or not you're safe when you do your job. Yeah, and, and if, you, if you want to, to manage this territory, which, which is productive, right? Which, which is profitable to manage, which is good for your career, uh, you have to figure out how, how, how to keep yourself safe because we're not going to do anything. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm a former marketing rep myself. It's my favorite role on the carrier side. Yeah, And, it was and I, I had no idea. Right. I, as, as, as a guy, I never dealt with that. No. And I mean, it's different from person to person too. It depends on how you look, how you present. Um, but I will tell you, people would be shocked to hear what happens behind closed doors because it's not talked about. And it, when it is, it's either signed confidentiality or it's like, it sounds so unbelievable. Mm -hmm. that you're like, there is no way that that happened. I had a really, really rough incident when I first went into marketing as a brand new rep, you know, you got your notepad out, you got your pen. And I walked into an office and was told two of the like most unbelievable things I've ever heard. Um, if I may, he said, the worst thing we ever did was give women the right to vote. The second worst thing we did was give women the right to drive. And this is 2016, okay? So like, I am a young rep, I like fresh. Like this is the first time I'm at this agency office. I am alone with this man across from me and the door is shut. And this is what he says to me. And I was so taken back because that's not part of your training. Like I'm there to talk about, you know, our liability policy for contractors. I'm not there to talk about whether or not as a woman, I should drive or vote. Um, and something like that, I imagine sounds pretty un unbelievable to you, 
So you can imagine the position that puts that person in of like, do I even say something? Like, who's going to believe that this person said this to me? You, you, um, you don't know if it's happening to others, right? So you, you don't know if you have any backing, you don't, right? You don't know if you have, uh, yeah, I completely get it. He's, he's been an agent for, for 35 years for us, right? He's made right. president circle for the last 25. Uh, this is what we put up with to get X as like part of the conversation. Like this is the pound of flesh that we give up. Um, I found out years later when I told this story that multiple people had been affected by this particular human. Cause that's what happens. I think people mm. think that this is one of those things that literally everybody in the industry does. And I think to an extent that is our culture. So we allow it, but for the most part, the people that continue to be bad actors in this space are the ones that continue to do damage and they're doing so without being held accountable. So, so that, yeah. So we need a, some version of, of a protected whistleblower system that it kind of sounds like you're building it. We're we haven't talked about technology yet, but, but, uh, Right, right. And yeah, to be clear, again, so many people are working on different things in this space. And I think it's necessary because I think the general public has no idea how big really insurance is. Unless but, you're uh, in it, you don't think about it. Co correct, correct. A hundred percent. And but yeah, a lot of people are working in this space, right? I think of Amy Weininger, I, I, I think of, of Margaret Reese Millikan, but like there, there, there's, there's, I've met there's uh, right several, several, the, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I've met several who, who have pioneered this in our industry, but almost all of them, as far, as far as I can think, almost all of them have been focused on the education piece, which is, which is cri cri critical, it's absolutely right? Critical. Yes. But without uh, compliance, with, 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 without accountability, <laughs> Education right, only goes so far, especially when you're trying to change culture, which is what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, to your point. Yeah, there's no teeth to it. And I think really if what we're saying is we can't end a partnership or we can't value our employees because of X amount of dollars, then we need to show why it's profitable and we need to make it unprofitable to be terrible. We need to make it unprofitable, exactly. We need to shine a light on it so that... Uh, X carrier when word does come out. Well, first of all, make it easier for word to come out internally, and yes. when it does come out, uh, make make it so 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 that the, the the reaction is is no let's is is not okay a wrist slap and 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 a couple of NDAs to keep it from getting out, and we'll move people around like the Catholic Church, uh, <laughs> but, but 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 rather. Uh, so, so that, so that, that, that the stakes are higher, right? What, it, like, like yeah. you, you, you don't want to end up in, in, in the, the cover of the New York Times as the company that, that, that protected agent, a, a, you know, a, a, a recurring exactly a, a agent over and exactly yeah, absolutely yeah, but I think the other important part to think about is like if you're a carrier or an insure tech or another company in this industry doesn't it make sense, like from a profitability standpoint to not have to hire and recruit people? I, you've talked at length about the great resignation. I mean, and we had a talent crisis even before then. Why wouldn't you wanna value that? But on top of that, like I spent a lot of time in business school. I have an MBA. And one of the things they talk about is the project management side of things. And if you look at a project from the start to finish, it's not just, you finish the project and you move on at the very end you review what happened and try to either learn from it or replicate it depending on what happened as an industry we're missing this whole piece at the end by just cutting it off and saying oh we're done now and moving on because we're assuming that the two people at play or if there's more people at play are really the problem makers rather than thinking about what is the culture within our organization that allowed this to happen? Is this something that we can prevent in the future? I, I think that's absolutely crucial to understand that. I, I, I'm a big uh, behavioral psychology guy. And, and uh, the, the more that I read, the more that I get ed educated on, on, on it, the more that I'm convinced that, that the, fundamental, the fundamental attribution error is, is, is real. We, we, we tend to 
to believe that the participants are the problem. And the majority of the, I mean, there are rotten participants, but the majority of the time, the system is either creating the problem or at, at the very least allowing the problem yeah. to be recurring and not only be recurring, but to move to the next generation uh, in, 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 without getting fixed. Uh, so, so the system needs fixed. So, so tell me about, tell me about, about the, the technology. So we have the pledge. What is the technology that you want to build to 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 force compliance or to, or to, or to help our industry co come to where it needs to go? Right, and I do want to be clear. We believe in consent, so I don't want to force anybody to do anything. Like you will let us know who you are, and that's fine. Um, but the tech that we're actively building right now is called Medusa Score, and what it's meant to be is a culture check on an organization. So instead of a star rating or, you know, a percentage, like, did you have a good time while you worked here? It's not about, did you have a good time? Is the culture, are those values something that you value? And what are those? What do they look like? So things like accountability, integrity, communication, internal support, mentorship, things that you think about from a value base, because you mentioned millennials, which is a good thing to call out because we're making up or will make up the like the majority of the workforce. Already the then, plurality. Yep, and we're mm -hmm. a very value-based generation. And I, I hate to be the one to tell you this if you don't know it, but Gen Z is even more value-based than we are. So <laughs> if you're an employee in the industry looking for a job, you're gonna wanna look for an employer that embodies the same values that you do. So if it's accountability and communication, you can filter through the list of companies to say, these are the top two companies that really have nailed those down. But the other element that we want to build in after the fact is a consumer piece. Like what is the culture from the consumer side, which I think is also important because when you think about DEI in this industry, you also have to consider how you present yourself to the outer world. Insurance doesn't always have a great reputation. <laughs> How are yeah, you the working? exact opposite. <laughs> I mean, I always we're always it. fighting against the crappy yes. reputation, always. Yes. So, how can you help drive consumer behavior and employee behavior to uplift the companies that really have this figured out, or at least working on it and having the conversations internally? This can be that barometer for people that doesn't really exist at the moment. Yeah. No, I, I agree completely. I, ha I have not seen any measure uh that, that is comparable and 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 I, I do have to say for for the, for the listeners uh generationally which is what i always go go back to uh your employer brand is is crucial a hundred percent percent crucial a, a, and millennials and gen Zers absolutely do their best to 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 figure out your employer brand before coming to work for you and they will absolutely move to 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 where, where things are better. And in the post-COVID era, and I and I, I I've been saying post-COVID era for a while with Omicron, it doesn't appear that yeah, we're I there know. yet. Uh, but but in, in in the post-COVID era, our industry will be remote, uh, largely. Whether you whether you like it or not, largely it, it'll be remote, which means that we don't have to move for the job. Right, like, like I, I won't stay at a, I won't, I won't stay at Erie Insurance just because I want to live in Erie, right? right. Great company. Uh, I, I can work for Liberty or I can work for for freaking Mercury. I can work for somebody on the other side of the country that doesn't even oh. operate in my area, uh, if if they have the right culture. Uh, and maybe I'm willing to work a little bit of weird hours and travel once a month or, or, or whatever, that is becoming the reality of our industry as we emerge out of this mess. Uh, so your, your employer brand is more and more and more and more important when, when geography is no longer what, what keeps people working for you. Yeah, no, you hit the nail on the head. And I would just add to it, if you think about, because we've talked about the generations and we've talked about employees in the industry, if you think about it from a consumer standpoint, that has really been the trend over the course of the better part of this past decade. What does this organization support? Do I support those same things? Do I want to reward them 
with my money. So I think of it as a former marketing rep, as another selling point for your agency. Like, look who we are, look who we've attested to be. This is what we're committing to as an organization. And I personally would pers would purchase insurance from someone, even if it was slightly more, if they embodied the same values that I did. And knowing that millennials and Gen Z value these things, that's a really important factor to consider, as you said, in your organization's brand. Yeah, uh, 100% agreed. Um, so what, what, who is likely to be the, the entry point bringing you into the different carriers? Is it HR? Is it the chief diversity officer for the carriers that have that? Uh, are, are you seeing employees in different areas uh, being the bridge to get in? Uh, how, how, how are you actually getting in uh, to, to the different organizations in insurance? It's, it's a combo. It's all over the map and it's a lot of grassroots. So I personally have worked with two different carriers. So that's an entry point. We have a board of 12, an executive team of four, all of which have our own networks. So we're relying heavily on that. But to your point, it could be HR. It could be a chief diversity officer. We've even had employees within organizations advocate for us, which we knew was going to happen, which is why on our resources page, we built in pre-written emails that employees could use if they worked at a larger organization and they wanted to say, hey, like, this is really important to me. I like what this entity is doing. It would mean a lot to me if you signed this pledge. And we've had a, a few people that are underwriters, our marketing reps, have introduced us or like made the connection for us to talk to people. And I'd say by and large, we're seeing a lot of agencies and we're seeing a lot of insure tech and we're waiting on that first carrier to be like, okay, I think it's, I think it's time. You know how it works on the carrier side. We need, we need that validation externally from someone else. So when that first one does, I anticipate we'll see a few more people. Well, on, on the carrier side, it, it's it's uh, it's a two, a two year sales cycle, right? Even if you're not asking for money. No, uh, we're not. It, it, it's 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 a right. uh, it, because every decision is made by committee, and and every carrier thinks thinks of themselves as fast followers, and in reality, they're generally slow followers. Yeah. <laughs> So it'll, it'll yes, InsureTech will definitely sign up. Uh, that's fantastic that that agencies are signing up. Yeah. And, and to, to be honest, my heart is on the carrier side. Uh, the listeners are probably half carrier people. Uh, carrier people, if this is important for you, start pressuring the organization, uh, right? And and if you are active with with an employee resource group, like like I was for a long time at Nationwide, uh, you've got an even bigger megaphone. To, to get the company to, to, to listen to you and what you're asking for, uh, start asking the higher ups, start asking HR, tell them that this is important for you and, and for your peers. Uh, and, and the younger crowd, especially, you have no idea how much power you yield in so our much. crazy talent market. Uh, as many people retire, uh, start asking for, for support for, for this kind of initiative. Uh, so uh, when when this goes live, I, I will tag it. Uh, I will tag you on LinkedIn, uh, so that, so so you'll be easy to find uh, on on LinkedIn, and I I will include the link to to insureequality.org. And if I remember, I'll include the link to to the episode with 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 Meg McKean. Um, what it, what is the number one action item? Uh, not for the, not for the leadership. For the leadership, I, I think I think it's. You already it's, know what that is. Yeah. Yeah. Have the conversation. Sign the pledge. Uh, start being better. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. What what what's the number one action item for 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 the for the listeners for the, for the for the people for the employees that that can help push their companies in the right direction? Well, my marketing person will kill me because <laughs> I'm not immediately going to say, follow us and do all the, because all of that is important, but have the conversation, literally just talk about it. Because when you start talking about it, you start uncovering a lot more than you realized and a lot more than you thought would happen. I think in insurance, we don't always talk about it. 
for a lot of reasons, whether it's an NDA or, you know, you leave the personal stuff at home, you name it. But I will tell you, as someone that has had scores of conversations over the past year, the minute you start having that conversation, you humanize insurance immediately. The whole point of insurance is to indemnify someone, to make them whole again. And right now, we're kind of chipping away at our employee base. And we're feeling it. And we've been feeling it. And I think the pandemic just exacerbated it. So be candid about what you're going through. Talk about it. We're not in the business of trying to rid the insurance industry of people every time you make a mistake. I think there's this thought process that if you make a mistake, that makes you a bad person. We all make mistakes. That makes us human. I think what will really set the course right for insurance is having the conversation, owning it, and moving on, like actually taking ownership for it, where much of this has been swept under the rug. So talking about it is my number one thing. Just talk about it. Okay. Don't be afraid to have the conversation. Uh, but by the way, uh, listeners, uh, Insurance Nerds does have uh, a anonymous author program. Uh, it's only been used a couple of times, but we do have a process. Uh, so if, if you are a whistleblower, uh, it, all you can contact me or, or, or Carly, and, and uh, basically only one of us needs to know who you are. And uh, you let us know that you want to go through, through uh, I believe it's, it's called our uh, Publius process. Uh, that's the name that Alexander Hamilton used to write the, uh, the Federalist Papers. Uh, but but basically, will protect your identity. It, it goes through a through, through a, a more stringent editorial process to make sure that that we're not putting ourselves at, at you know legal risk by by running it. But but uh, it, it's here to get the word out on things that that are hard to communicate uh, with your name on them. Yeah, they can do the same thing on our site too. So depending on your level of comfort, we're offering the ability for people to share that with us as well it will be anonymous you can check out previous and, stories submitted as well and and we really we really should have spent more time thank you for reminding me on, on the share yeah. your story feature for 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 insurance quality be, because i i think that that this is exactly like how did the me too movement in the over in the overall society uh, become powerful when, when the people who had been victimized uh, realized that that the, number one they were not alone, uh, and 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 num number two realized that sh that having the bravery to share the story could could change the system could 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 help prevent the next person from right right first of all show empathy to to others that have gone through it but also prevent it from happening again right. Uh, so, so we can achieve the same thing with, with an insurance, but by, by sharing your story. That's such a key point because I don't think listeners know this. And I mean, to be honest, I didn't even know it. I assumed that everything that I went through was just known and either they were working on it or they didn't have the time or the money or the resources or whatever. But I will tell you, having told my story to carriers, agencies, insure techs, um, having given snippets of what I've heard recur in people's stories, carriers are kind of shocked. I'm going to be honest. They're shocked at knowing this or they know it happens and they're in that moment realizing, wow, I didn't, I didn't think about how impactful that particular piece was. And that's really it. It's not that this industry as a whole is just like, we're going to, you know, make it miserable to work here. We don't want that. Um, it's that because it's not known or talked about or widely understood, everything kind of just stays, as you said earlier, status quo. I, I agree. I agree. It, there's, there's not a giant conspiracy to, to, to hold women down with an insurance or, 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 or to, to make it a hard place to work at. We're talking about a lot of old companies with a lot of, of habits that haven't yet gone away, basically. And, and, and if the light's not shined, then those things 
uh, take longer and longer to 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 go to go away. That that's that's what it, what it is. But quite simply, like we're talking about a lot of of 80, 100, 150 year old companies, uh, and the world has radically changed around them, yes. and they are by nature slow to change because that's how they've survived as insurance companies is by being conservative on the underwriting side. Um, so we need to shine those lights. And yeah. I think thank you for 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 fearlessly doing that work uh in 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 a way that that uh that that is organized and 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 well thought enough and and helping us come uh, helping create the tools to to create that accountability that we so desperately need uh i i i very often t tell guests that they'd love to have you back and you know hear how things are going in your case i really really mean it uh yeah. as uh this so i really hope that that the appearance in the podcast will will get you a lot more exposure and a lot more interest uh, from other companies and, and a lot of of, of employees at different companies uh, pushing for for this and i hope that we have you back in a, in a year 18 months or, or whatever and and have some real success stories of how some of the, some of the of the big players uh showed up at the table and started making changes and started uh not only signing the pledge but but changing how they do things in order to 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 comply with what they've promised thank you and i will take you up on that and we're in the point right now where we've got some big things in the work that i can't wait to talk about but i cannot quite yet but i will say to your point this is a centuries old industry it is highly unlikely that <laughs> companies have not messed this up this isn't about calling that out it's about rising together and getting it to the place where we can all just be happy to be here. Like, I didn't want to leave insurance. I spent 10 years. I have six designations. That's not fun. Like to just transition out. Like, why would I want to do that? Um, but it goes back to like, why wouldn't we want this place to be better for everyone? So I, I do appreciate that. And I will say, if you're a company that has signed the pledge or you're thinking about it and you're like, but how does that help? First of all, you're declaring your values to the world, which is really important. You're showing what you stand for. It's part of your brand. But secondly, I had at least two now different people that have signed the pledge come back to me saying, can I have a copy of what I signed? Because we're going to integrate it in our HR handbook, or we're going to use this as a guide to kind of form how we handle things going forward. So you can get creative with it. You can also just have a conversation with us. We're very happy to talk this through with you. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for your time and, and for putting in the work. Uh, yeah. we're, here, we're, we're here to help um, uh, amplify the message. Thanks, Tony. I really appreciate it.